Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Mark Cochran, the Regional Manager in Asia for UFI. Welcome to this webinar. Uh, this is the second one that we've done in Asia. The first was about a month ago, but obviously UFI is putting these out uh, three or four times a week. So plenty of opportunity to connect with our colleagues around the world. So today we're going to focus on uh, the role of government, what government can do to help us out of obviously the, the largest crisis in the, in the history of our industry. So today what we're going to do is uh, I'll run you through um, basically the agenda. I've got some introductory slides. Our speakers are going to make some brief opening remarks. And then we really want to engage with you guys and give you the opportunity to ask questions. So when you want to ask a question, you can just simply click on the chat and post it in the chat to everyone. Uh, and then if we can get to it, if we can fit it in, we will. And we'll take it from there. So I will start by sharing my slides. All right, there we go. So first, uh, just briefly, our speakers, we have uh, four panelists. We have Stuart with me here in Hong Kong. He is an organizer and also chairman of HASEA. And uh, we have Grace Mack, who is actually also in Hong Kong right now, but uh, she's usually based in Beijing and she's the regional director for EJ Krauss. We have Andrew Pua, who is executive director at uh, Singapore Exhibition and Convention Bureau. And we have uh, Nichapa Yoswe, who is the Senior Vice President at TSEB in Thailand. So a couple slides that I prepared for you. So uh, at UFI, we have been monitoring uh, what packages governments are announcing, what initiatives they have to help support our industry. Uh, and I'll take you through just a couple key markets in Asia right now. I, I think uh, most of us were pleasantly surprised by Hong Kong, a fairly generous, fairly large uh, initiative already unveiled, worth about 130 million US. There's two components to that. Uh, first is 100% of venue rental will be covered for organizers, that non-TDC organizers, who are holding international exhibitions and conferences. Uh, at the two main venues in Hong Kong. So that's HKCC and Asia World Expo. And that initiative will run for 12 months after events resume in Hong Kong. The second, perhaps a, a little more controversial, is 50% uh, off the participation fee for local SMEs, but that only applies to exhibitions organized by the TDC. Uh, and that's capped at 10,000 Hong Kong and will run for 12 months also. Uh, in addition to that, there's about 145 million that has been uh, earmarked for the tourism board to promote tourism to Hong Kong for a year running from starting from uh, April. In Singapore, uh, there's quite a few. I'll just pick a couple highlights from this and let Andrew maybe dig into a little more detail. Uh, there's the job scheme, which covers 75% of wages, uh, and that includes all sectors within MICE from, uh, for April and May this year, and that's capped at 4,600 Sing uh, as a monthly wage. There's also tax rebates, rental waivers, uh, and um, increased subsidies for training and education. Another seven, uh, excuse me, another 90 million Sing towards uh, tourism recovery, which uh, I'll let Andrew explain a little more in his uh, opening remarks. Thailand, more than 70 billion uh, has been earmarked for, that's for the overall recovery of the Thai economy focused on uh, SMEs. There's several phases to that stacked towards the, uh, with the bulk of that in the third phase. TSEB has also unveiled a, a program of over 15 million US uh, with response recovery and restoration and uh, Nee Chapel will cover that uh, in her opening remarks. In China, of course, there's, uh, there's no national authority, so it's not gonna come out at the national level, but at the provincial and at the city level, there are some uh, programs that ha have already been announced. So Beijing has a rental scheme of um, 
up to 500,000 RMB for, uh, for venue rental in Guangdong. They have 50% financial subsidies for participation in trade promotion activities and exhibitions up to 100,000 RMB. And then there's other uh, sort of lighter financial subsidies in cities like Chengdu and Nanjing. Okay. All right, so now what I'm gonna do is uh, I'm gonna hand over to each of our panelists, ask them to take just five minutes to give uh, a brief update about their markets uh, and what they see going on there in terms of government support and just generally when things might get going again. So we'll start with Stuart Bailey, Chairman of ASEA here in Hong Kong. Stuart, over to you. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, great. Wow. 180 people have turned up to listen to this afternoon. That's, that's great. And, and nice to see so many familiar faces. Um, look, it's been a really weird time in Hong Kong. Um, we've effectively had no major trade events happening at all this year. Um, we really started to understand what COVID-19 was in January, um, which was just before Chinese New Year. Um, normally in the course of my job, I, I'm, I'm visiting the venue at least once a week. And and I haven't been there since February. And, and the last time that I was there, I mean, it was shut down. It was a ghost town. So in some ways, it, it's pretty sad what's happened. Um, however, I've had more conversations with people in our industry um, over the last, you know, three or four months than I think I've ever had. You know, Skype calls, Zoom calls, you know, telephone calls, just checking in with our members and, and, and really kind of, you know, trying to understand how they're doing, uh, what strategies they're finding to kind of survive, and what things that they're looking to kind of, you know, pivot to, whether it's digital events or, or sort of, you know, doing other things. Um, in terms of the measures that the government has taken here in Hong Kong, um, Mark mentioned um, the subsidy scheme for venue um, for organisers. Um, yes, this was um, gratefully uh, accepted um, and, and we're all kind of keen to see um, how we could use this, uh, this money to the best advantage. However, uh, slightly disappointing in the way that it's being administrated, which means that you're actually, organisers are not able to get um, the venue paid for free by the government. What actually happens is that the organiser must pay the venue, must pay the deposits, must do everything in the usual way, um, and then they are reimbursed um, between six to eight weeks after the exhibition takes place. Um, as I said, still grateful, but given that what's happening with COVID-19 at the moment is really primarily about cash flow, we could really use that money so that we could pump it into other areas such as visitor promotion or making sure that our suppliers are getting paid and all of those sorts of things. So it's, yes, it's great. Uh, we wish it could be done slightly better. Um, the other mention uh, was that uh, local uh, small to medium sized enterprises could get a grant of about 1,300 US dollars towards a booth, but this only applies to Trade Development Council shows. Uh, again, we, don't, we, we, we believe it's a good initiative, but it's an initiative which should be uh, able to be enjoyed um, by small companies wanting to join any trade exhibition. Um, any, any company at the moment that's had a difficult time, everybody has, uh, and is leading to kind of kickstart sales, to develop sales leads and pipelines, they should be joining trade exhibitions. So regardless of whether it's a, a TDC one or not, we'd like to see that, that opportunity passed on to them. Um, the other, uh, which uh, was mentioned in the Singapore slides, but wasn't in the Hong Kong, uh, was there is uh, an employee salary subsidy scheme. Um, this effectively gives um, employers um, up to 50% of a person's wages, um, but that is capped at 1,150 US dollars, uh, which is a relatively small amount um, given what average salaries are uh, here in Hong Kong and certainly within our industry. Um, now look, all of these measures, they help business. Um, we are grateful for what's gone so far, but we don't believe that that's gonna be enough really to kind of help us to a survive and, and, and be kind of, you know, kick on to the next stage. So we continue to talk to the government about other measures that, that they might be able to do uh, in order to help our industry. Um, a, a couple of things that we do talk about. One, uh, the employee salary scheme really ought to be higher. Um, I noticed that the cap in Singapore was four or four thousand, four and a half thousand. 
compare that with the 1,100. I mean, it, it, it's small beer uh, that we get. Um, equally, um, we think that uh, given we all know Hong Kong um, suffers the, some of the highest rents in the world, um, something to alleviate small businesses um, in terms of their commercial rent. So a subsidy scheme um, to, to help people to kind of pay the rent and keep the lights on. So look, there are a couple of things that we are bringing forward. Um, also, obviously, as we start to move from the survive phase into the, the kind of the rebound phase, um, it becomes much, much more of a, a sort of a, a tourism thing. Um, and there's equally, there's been money, uh, which Mark mentioned, that has been av made available um, to the Hong Kong Tourism Board in order to help us to connect with markets that we really want to see come back as soon as possible, as soon as it's safe to do so. Uh, and I've got some, some further thoughts on that, but I, I, I noticed I, I'm up to five minutes. Gosh, that went quick. Uh, so, Mark, I'll, uh, I'll pass back to you. Uh, thank, thanks, Stuart. Yeah, good stuff. And uh, I've got a couple of questions, but let's run through the other panelists and then uh, we'll come back to that, okay? So, uh, next up for introductory remarks, Grace from EJ Kraus. I can see her. Hi, Mark, and uh, everybody. It's so good to be able to say hello, at least online. Uh, definitely the uh, unprecedented uh, virus outbreak was a total shock, and uh, I'm still <laughs> trying to uh, get back to uh, realize, you know, this is not a dream. And, um, well, um, there are a lot of uh, good news recently in China, which I like to share a little bit here. Uh, Mark just mentioned that, um, you know, uh, on the national level, um, it doesn't seem to have the, you know, the same uh, uh, national uh, support scheme like Hong Kong, which is, you know, a, a smaller, a smaller market and easier to handle. So um, I can see that, um, you know, after the outbreak, um, the Chinese government actually has uh, taken steps uh, to uh, to support this industry very early, uh, back in uh, February, March, and um, they have uh, given guidelines, you know, framework uh, recommendation, but not so much uh, details on, on on financials and all those. So. Um, the government has uh, promoted, you know, uh, innovative ideas and uh, using uh, technology and, uh, you know, also asking uh, to uh, develop more in the uh, virtual exhibitions, etc., to to help the transition. So, um, it, right in the beginning, the government has uh, has been very active in the support program, and. Um, but I mean, in China, uh, usually in the past, uh, the, the provincial uh, governments will have their own support uh, scheme. So uh, Mark has also mentioned, you know, some of the, the, the schemes uh, in, in Beijing and in, uh, in uh, uh, Guangdong, et cetera. And uh, I'm not in a position here to, you know, to quote all of those because I understand uh, all the provincial governments uh, will tailor make their own support scheme uh, to support the industry. What I would like to uh, share here is um, we have the, uh, I think a lot of you have already heard about the, uh, the uh, Hunan Auto Show, which was just uh, uh, unbelievable. It uh, was open on, on April 30th and, uh, you know, the uh, exhibit floor was uh, like 60,000. 60,000 square meters and um, six day show. And um, everything was carefully uh, planned out. Uh, the government definitely has played a very important role because uh, they work with the, uh, the uh, local exhibition bureau, they work with the organizers and work with all the uh, different parties that are involved to, uh, to come up with a plan to make sure that, you know, the uh, preventive and control measures are uh, well understood, clear, and also follow through. So it was a very successful uh, uh, event, uh, and it is an indication uh, to both the government and also to the people that it is possible to um, start uh, reopening the, the industry if uh, the, the government and the uh, and the uh, uh, 
local uh, authorities and uh, organizers, different parties work together. So um, I, I, I really don't have to, <laughs> to promote this, this event because it's already done and it was proven uh, successful. But what triggered uh, my, my thought was um, in, in this event, um, definitely never before had the government been so much involved in uh, with the different parties, you know, like the uh, the uh, health uh, the health bureau and uh, and uh, the public security, um, the commercial departments, and all these. And even after all this, we we are thinking of or we are looking at. Um, they have some very creative uh, uh, incentive program, and I think you may have heard about you know the government coming up uh, uh, coming up with. Uh, 30 million yuan just for subsidies of the car, it is an auto show uh, for the car uh, uh, sales and which uh, ended up uh, more than 2000, 2006, 2700 uh, cars were sold and uh, uh, totaling uh, 5.6 billion uh, RMB. So I think uh, for the, you know, for, for the um, support program, uh, the uh, local government and also the, uh, the organizers are really thinking of something very creative. So that, that is, uh, that is uh, the first uh, large size event that is uh, being publicized and proven uh, successful. And now we heard about you know, other uh, auto shows and, and, uh, and, and other um, um, yeah. Uh, events uh, being planned and announced uh, to be to be held um, and to start with I think um, uh, what the from the uh, exhibitions that are uh, planned to be held um, it looks like um, uh, they are more uh, consumer based uh, exhibitions so uh, this will fit into what the government is looking for uh, consumer shows to drive the uh, the, uh, the local consumption and also uh, it is you know mass gathering which can be uh, controlled uh, uh, and uh, can uh, be uh, safe and you know health is uh, uh, guaranteed if you follow the uh, the instructions carefully so this looks like uh, the other uh, shows that will start first and uh, at, at this point, I don't see many uh, B2B trade events, uh, which really are very high tech and um, requires a lot of, uh, of uh, overseas uh, participants uh, to happen, particularly right now, the travel restrictions are still, you know, in place and uh, uh, foreign nationals uh, don't really have the, the, the choice of uh, uh, entering into China at this point, uh, if they are just holding visas. And um, another thing that I would like to share here is uh, on the on May the seventh, uh, the China State Council issue a circular that um, uh, lay out very uh, in great details on you know the the uh, guidance and instructions for. Uh, for preventive and, and emergency uh, response measures. So, but one thing that really ca uh, caught uh, everybody's eyes uh, uh, is that um, exhibitions can now open. So this is really the first time the official announcement that uh, yes, it is safe to, uh, to uh, reopen the exhibition uh, industry in China. Now, having said that, um, I'm sure uh, there will be more uh, more uh, policies coming as to you know how uh, the local governments and uh, the the organizers and all the parties concerned uh, will have to will have to do and will have to follow you know when a show should be open where and who should uh, run it and uh, what kind what type and et cetera, et cetera. There, there are very detailed uh, guidance uh, for, for those. So, uh, but the, the good news is that the government is very positive in opening up the industry. And um, so I, I hope uh, uh, with China uh, have setting up the, uh, the uh, first uh, uh, steps uh, to, to uh, open the industry, 
that will be Grace. a good sign for other people too. Yeah, Grace, sorry. I'll ask you that what you just said about the state council, it's really important. I think everyone's interested in it. So let's circle back to that after uh, the opening remarks, okay? Okay, okay. But, yep, th thanks very much. That's it for me, yeah, thank you. Thank you, appreciate it, Grace. Uh, okay, so now we'll go to Andrew Pua, who's executive director at SECB in Singapore. Andrew? Thank you, Mark, and hi, everyone from Singapore. Um, just to give a very quick snapshot on what has happened over the last few months from February, and um, perhaps let's first start off with uh, Singapore, like many other countries, we have acted to prioritize health and well-being over uh, economic gain. And I think the, the, the part about putting transparency to the system and putting safety above short-term gain is what we have been doing. Um, on a wider platform, uh, to ensure preparedness for the recovery, uh, there is a Tourism Recovery Action Task Force that has been formed. And this started as early as February. And MICE is definitely one of the verticals that we are looking at. And the whole task force is, to, is looking at developing and implementing joy recovery uh, strategies uh, together with the government as well as the stakeholders. Now, we are very mindful that while we are saving lives, it's also about saving livelihood. And you have heard from Mark that um, one of the schemes that has been getting a lot of positive response was the job support scheme, where the government subsidized 75% uh, of the first 4,600 uh, Singapore dollars of the gross salary. And this is for the month of April to May. And this will essentially cover the wages of employees of a company and including the shareholders and directors of the specific firm. Uh, the Singapore circuit breaker will actually end uh, 1st of June and we are now looking at measures that will gradually ease over time next month as the COVID-19 community cases decline in numbers and we progressively open up our economy. Besides the job support scheme, there are a couple of uh, other schemes that we have been working uh, uh, very closely with our stakeholders and one is really about training. So we are beefing up uh, using this downtime to look at a higher proportion of course fees to be subsidized up to 90% and including approved training programs and adopting a virtual format together with our industry association, SASIOS, to come up with a couple of virtual meetings and development courses. Uh, safe distancing measures will probably be the new norm and I'd uh, like to thank UFI and, and Germany and China for, for, for creating those guidelines which are very good reference for all of us and we will be working in partnership with our stakeholders to come up with the guidelines to ensure that when we are reopened for business, uh, whether it's in a physical format or a hybrid format, uh, there will be a very clear framework of guidelines or a playbook which the industry will be able to adhere to if they wish to run events during this new normal period. Um, apart from that, uh, I think perhaps three things that we're working very closely with the industry uh, during this town time. Number one is really to innovate and reconfigure our event formats, given that there will be new uh, business opportunity we have to look at. We, we have to look at new measures in order to have trade shows to happen. Number two, uh, to upskill ourselves for a post-COVID-19 world through training, capability development. And number three, to really explore uh, partnerships and alliances with our industry peers and the industry and community at large in Singapore. And this will help us to position for a, a swift recovery when the time comes. Um, I think heartened to say that Asia Pacific might be the first region to return to a new normal or rebound. And we'll continue to create, attract and grow business events, working closely with our industry partners and socios. And I think one critical part about partnership and alliances is the part about forced innovation. I think the fact that we are all meeting virtually and in fact i have more virtual meetings than ever before in this few months many webinars but um, nothing is going to take away face-to-face -face meeting in terms of reading the body nuances and the body language and i think that is critical but what is important is how do we then embrace digitalization and embrace um, innovation in our trade shows in time to come so one example that we have launched last year was a wechat mini program we are the first country destination to do so uh, to better serve the needs of uh, MICE visitors from China. And as we slowly open up and, have, and tr with travel restrictions lifted, we are looking forward to leverage such digital tools to engage our customers, both from an online to an offline and back to online again, as we start to host business events in Singapore. Thanks, Mark. Yeah. Great, thanks, Andrew. Okay, so now we'll go to our fourth panelist, uh, Nichapa, who's Senior Vice President at uh, TSEB, coming from Bangkok. All right, Nichapa. 
Thank you, Mark. Um, on behalf of my colleagues at TSIP, I hope that all of you are keeping well. It's so good to see everybody here. I would like to first like to take this opportunity to express gratitude to all the healthcare professionals worldwide for their dedication and risking their lives for our well-being. So thanks to all the medical and frontline heroes. Since the outbreak, the Thai government had came up with three phases of economic relief and stimulus measured um, with more than 7 billion US dollars, mainly to support SME, and that includes my stakeholders, series of soft loans, debt rescheduling, tax relief, lower utility costs, wage management or compensation, cash handouts to those workers who are not in the social security system, and the latest initiative is um, bond issuance. Um, in the area of health and hygiene, um, the government exercises extreme monitoring system um, like self-quarantine, travel restriction, uh, night curfew even, uh, mass gathering, lockdown, and they also set up COVID situation administration to provide a daily briefing on TV to announce any new measures, to call for collaboration, to show empathy, and uh, most of all to respond um, to the voice from the pe people. And I believe that the strict measures paid off because as of last week, uh, we have single digit new cases and the statistic is showing a very positive sign. So now the government is carefully looking into the reopening measures and of course, um, um, they will do so in phases. The first phase will be this Saturday for department store and restaurants and of course with new norm in terms of strict hygiene practices. And if everything goes well, TSEP is pushing MICE to be in the second reopening group, which will be in June. Now, as for exhibition industry, TSEP supported um, 56 international exhibitions this year. To date, five cancelled. The rest, 51, are confirmed and will be um, on during the second half of the year. I think that that um, it happens because we have our past crises to thank to. Um, with the experience of past crises, um, TSEP basically activated the business continuity plan and operate in the crisis mode since January. Um, even though the situation may seem intermediate at the time. And in February, we came up with the three R strategy, the response, recovery, and restoration, three year restoration plan. The first R in the, on the response, uh, we provide 4 million US dollars, and that would be for February and until May. We set up MICE COVID Info Center. We immediately relax the support criteria. We provide additional relief campaign to all events this year. We provide hygiene funds to venue. We provide special funds to activate domestic mice. And we establish virtual meeting space and online platform for webinar, virtual events, e-learning, and that is for public use. We also work very closely with our customers to make sure that we gain the commercial insights to evaluate and come up with the uh, projection on the upcoming impact so that we can prioritize, we coordinate and collect all the initiatives and then we come up with a super subvention program tailor-made to each needs. Um, the recovery and three-year restoration, we focus on two dimensions. One is on government policy. We are pushing MICE to be in the second reopening group. And in doing so, TSEP and all MICE Association, we came together and produced the first business events, hygiene, disciplines, measures for Thailand. And already sent this measure to the Ministry of Health for screening. And if they agreed, of course, they, I believe that the MICE sector can be opened in June. TSEP is also pushing MICE to be in one of the recovery focused sectors which will enable the flow of recovery funds, the tax taxation regime, visa facilitations, and logistics arrangement. Now on private side, we are working to create new products and services. Technology will play a big part and will be included. And we are now incubating, promoting domestic mice and formulating new subvention program to facilitate international events to serve new normal and to drive exhibition ecosystem. Yeah, that's, that's um, for now, Mark.
Thanks, Njapa. That's great. All right, everyone. Um, so if you have any questions for the speakers, you can post them uh, in the chat. We already have a few queued up. So first we'll go to uh, Matt Pierce in, in Melbourne, I believe. Matt, are you there? I am, thanks, Mark. Um, and it's a great session, thanks, guys. So my question is, is really around, we've all seemed to have been thrown over the blanket, the blanket of mass gatherings has been thrown over all of us. And certainly we're working hard and we've seen a few work hard to separate us from mass gatherings. Is that being done in other parts? I mean, I, China, Hong Kong, Thailand and so forth. Is, that, is there a recognition that we are not mass gatherings, that we have far greater control? Uh, thanks, Matt. Yeah, good question. And that's obviously something that UFI is lobbying pretty hard on, spending a lot of our time and resources to uh, get that message across to government. Uh, Stuart and maybe Nichapa, you, you want to comment on that? Stuart, would so you like I'll, to go I'll, first? I'll, yeah, I'll have a quick crack because, look, the government haven't made the position clear, if I'm honest. Um, however, we have a very um, pro-business government um, and, and, and we're pretty, we think it's pretty likely that they will make uh, a definite exception between trade events and, and, and mass gatherings. Um, I'll give you a, a quick example of how pro-business um, pro they are. Um, we are scheduled on the 8th of June um, to no longer need quarantine between the other parts of Greater China. I mean, China, Macau and Taiwan. Um, people can move freely. However, at this point, people who can prove that their trip is for a business purpose are able to cross those borders without need for the 14 day quarantine. So they're the kind of measures that you can see that they're putting in to try and get business moving as quickly as possible. So yeah, I, I'm pretty confident that, that we'll be treated separately from other types of gatherings. Good stuff, uh, yeah. Nijapa? Right. As for Thailand, we do not make it an issue. Um, we just present the two as separate, two separate sectors, mice and festival. So right now we are working closely with the government in terms of reopening the whole mice sector. We already have um, put all the criteria in place in the hygiene disciplines because because right now the government would only focus and listen to the Ministry of Health, the advice from the Ministry of Health, because they want to make sure that nothing, that there would be a super spreader coming back again. Um, so first mice and then um, later on a festival. Mm. Uh, Andrew, what about in Singapore? Thanks, Mark. Um, for, for Singapore, we are working out the measures to gradually open up the economy. But uh, for the Singapore Tourism Board or SECB, we do recognize that B2B exhibitions and trade shows are different from the B2C or the mass gathering. Uh, I think one most important distinction is the physical setups of uh, trade shows and business events together with the safety distancing measure or even safety management measures are not a major issue for business events. I think even when it comes to contact tracing, uh, temperature screening, it's e relatively easier to, to, to implement this for business event as compared to a big festival or mass gathering. I think the other part we were trying to also put up to, for justification is B2B exhibitions are one of the most effective multipliers to let our tourism industry and the economic, indu economic drivers that these trade shows are promoting and this would definitely help the economy to rebound fastest across the whole value chain. Yeah. Great, thanks, Andrew. Uh, and obviously I think in China, it's already, we can see that they're viewing them separately. As uh, Grace mentioned, the state council uh, directive came out specifically mentioning exhibitions being allowed to go ahead. Okay, uh, yeah, next. Particularly, I, oh, I sorry, go ahead, particularly in China, they have this famous uh, health code network. So everybody's got, you know, their, their health uh, tracked and um, traced. And so I, I think they are doing a really good job. And uh, also, um, it, in a way, it's not just one party checking. If, you, uh, if you're working, you know, your office uh, building will check on you, your uh, home uh, community will check on you, supermarkets will check on you, you know, everywhere is uh, temperature taking and also uh, looking at a green, green sign, you know, in the, uh, in the health code. So uh, Grace, uh, that's pretty can you, effective. Grace, could yeah. you take a minute to explain a little bit more about that health code, how it works, what the components are to it? The, the government has uh, uh, 
uh, design an app which uh, you know people can uh, download and then uh, you have to report your your um, uh, your uh, body temperature and also uh, you know if you have uh, any contacts with suspected cases and confirmed cases things like that so and this code um, is a daily a daily operation that you have to uh, catch up with um, if you if all the information you input is uh, is uh, you know uh, healthy uh, healthy status, then you get a green pass. So using this green pass, you can go you know to a lot of places and uh, even going to supermarket if you know uh, or uh, in the subway if you show that you, you don't have a, a green a green uh, sign green pass, then you, you will have problems uh, in entry or uh, you know people may even watch you closely and see if you have uh, uh, health problems. So this and is did, just Pan China. And, and did they use that at the Hunan uh, auto show last week? I am, I am sure, I am sure. Yeah, I'm sure because you, you have to have it, uh, you have to use it everywhere you go. So, and this is not new, it has been in practice for a long time. Uh, very much uh, since in the early age, uh, early stage of uh, of uh, the the uh, preventive and control uh, measures uh, announced. And actually, while we're on that, uh, I'm not sure if he's still there. If Michael Krupper is there from SNEAC, uh, I know some of his staff were at that event in Hunan. Yeah, Michael, uh, maybe you want to tell us a little bit about what your staff saw on the ground at that event in Hunan. Yeah, hey everybody, Mark, I'm always there, even you don't see me or hear me, I'm always behind the scenes, <laughs> as you know. So, well, the Hunan thing was a kind of kickoff for all of us, um, but meanwhile, as Grace just said, and some of us here in China know, as of Friday night, uh, Saturday morning, we have received an official go, and I'm right now sitting over the final document, which was already sent out in the group, um, maybe some, I'm sure, Grace, you've seen that already, which is kind of uh, implementing parts we have seen in Hunan. That means uh, handing out gloves, automatic uh, sanitation for the fingers and the hands and so on. Uh, and surprisingly, uh, Mark, the final document now uh, officially published by the Sh Shanghai Association is actually shorter than the one we have designed a month ago and which was that time overruled by the State Council. So I think this is all great news and good news. Um, I'm sure everybody will know these documents within the next couple of days, uh, but it basically leaves it to the organizer and the venue that we should mainly handle these kind of already known common sense uh, kind of control points, uh, temperature check and so on. What we are right now doing is, because this document does not have any information about two things. Number one is the the limitation on the potential visitors, because that's for me is a key point. Um, if a show have uh, usually 50,000 visitors to say something, um, what is safe in the eyes of the government? Is it now 50% or is it 70%? Um, so this, I think it's up to us, mainly organizers and venue to proactively come up with a kind of formula. That's what I personally think at this very moment Certainly, we need to discuss this in a in different forum as well. And, and the second point is that, like uh, I have heard from Brussels, Mark, you probably know from David and from Dennis there, they will implement some ultra ultraviolet UV lamps and infrared stations in the venue, which is really expensive. Um, but this technology is not mentioned in our document here in Shanghai. Um, well, maybe because of lack of scientific uh, evidence that it helps. Uh, this, however, over time may change. So who knows, maybe in six months, we will have a new or an adjusted version asking us to implement this kind of equipment. So Michael, it, so it sounds like you're saying uh, in China, basically the top-down directive is gonna be, it it's okay to go ahead, but it's up to each sort of venue and organizer to, to come up with their own uh, specific requirements about what's needed? I guess so. And, and Grace, you mentioned before that you think it's primarily B2C events. Uh, I partly agree on that. However, we already have confirmed our Simicon show here in, in June 
uh, China Joy is definitely a consumer show, but Silicon is definitely a B2B. Uh, I think it will be a mix. Uh, definitely B2C events will be more in the open. Uh, but uh, I just had a meeting, a lunch with uh, Wang Mingliang here from Sano Expo. You all know him. Uh, we are all very positive on B2B as well. So, uh, yeah, B2C already before the virus was more important. Uh, as most of you know, uh, if you talk about events or festivals or whatever, but uh, I'm, I'm quite positive that the B2B also will be coming out strong. And as I quickly drafted in the, in the chat, we have a situation now where a couple of B2B shows are considering to reduce square meters and or days, which may then give other previously canceled or postponed shows from the first half year a chance to jump in, to be squeezed in into that new time slot. Let's see. So we are, we are very positive, very happy right now in Shanghai. And so, uh, sorry, Michael, I'm going to stay with you because this is good, good stuff. So uh, you see B2B events coming back to Shanghai uh, when? I mean, it's basically up to the organizers when they want to go ahead now since they have the green light. Is that what you're saying? Well, I think everybody is getting very excited and, and uh, people are even, uh, I cannot, conf I can only confirm Simicon right now, but we're even having plans with most of them you would know, but I cannot say who it is right now on plans on having two or three larger events sorry, B2B shows, still in June, maybe on a smaller scale, uh, because, yeah, I think any square meter you can catch with the official approval from government is something as an organizer you should look at right now. And me as a venue, I'm also happy if you come. So we're in the same boat, um, but it's not too much time left for, I mean, that sounds stupid, I know, because before mm. we were thinking maybe we have six months or even longer time to think about it, now it came as a surprise, but middle of June is only one month left. For some of you who are the organizers know that one month is not enough. Uh, so because of that, Grace, maybe it still will be just events of B2C or a mix of both. Let's see. Okay. And, and Hugh, I, I actually, I saw you had a question for Michael. Uh, you, you were asking about uh, Public Security Bureau. Yes, thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Michael. Yeah, well, that's very good news. And uh, I think we're in a similar boat in uh, Zhengzhou. But the question I wanted to ask was, as soon as we got this message, the next thing we got was um, a notification from the public security people in the city saying, well, hold on. So I'm just wondering, Michael, whether your public security guys are all on board with uh, your go ahead plan. Of course they are. I have uh, tomorrow afternoon another meeting with our Pudong head of uh, PSV. Uh, but even before that, we have regular meetings, not necessarily involving myself, but our teams are more or less on a weekly, if not daily basis, in contact, especially before the announcement came from State Council. So we were, or my team were, and other venues and organizers pushing these poor guys from the PSB giving any possible reason why it's now safe and whatever to run a show and to open a venue. Uh, of course, these guys are nervous. And from the mm -hmm. Wuhan case, which happened, I think, over the weekend, five cases, I think the, the, the security guy in that specific compound was already fired because whatever happened there. So I know it's highly risky for anybody who gives green light in our industry. Um, but I also mentioned, I uh, had a call with Sandy this morning and also with Wang Mingliang just now before. I think we all know that there is no 100% safety in, uh, in this situation. Neither is in car driving, neither is in flying. So um, I think in the end, and that's my point, we have designed a lot of uh, protocols and ideas how to run it safe. There is a certain rest risk, is that English mark? Uh, rest of a risk, yeah. Yeah, and that yeah. something may happen, but this may happen even without a virus uh, on a daily basis. And uh, if people get not too nervous about one or two new cases, which maybe happens, uh, if the public security did not, or the government did, will not get too nervous about these cases, if they happen, then I think we would be okay. Yeah, but inevitably, I think we're going to have some second waves, as we've already seen in uh, small ones in uh, Korea, Germany, now China. So, uh, okay, let's go on to the next question. I think Natalie Song has a question. Yes, hello, sorry. 
um, with, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, go ahead, uh, Natalie. Sure, uh, with like current travel restrictions, I wonder is there any a roadmap for um, international event organizers to bring the shows back to um, all the markets here, like China, Hong Kong, Singapore, and Thailand? I, I think, yeah, so that's the main question. And is there any like um, plan in place to uh, encourage or help the uh, organizers like us based in like, Europe? Okay, so the, the question is, uh, is there a roadmap for events that have uh, an international component? Maybe I think that, that's maybe best for Andrew and Nichapa. Do, do you guys have any plan, any timeline uh, about how you're going to help organizers that run uh, highly international events? Nichapa, why don't you go first? Right. Um, definitely, we have roadmap for that. We already have a specific um, industry in mind because the government has already launched the focus sectors, and that to me is um, one of the reasons why exhibitions can be extremely valid in terms of delivering the results. Um, we also um, have a series of supporting programs throughout the whole journey. Um, of running exhibitions, starting from venue um, and in terms of organizer. So um, even though we are bound by rigid uh, rules and regulations, I think TSEP, my team and myself, we have a very adaptive mindset and therefore we are open to uh, see what sort of support that um, we can provide in order to facilitate. Right now, what we had is, um, um, maybe the supporting system and infrastructure like customs visas or logistics we already have a joint operation committee with the government offices on that matter to ease the operations and also we are working very hard with the um, government to come up with what we call one sector one big expo which means that right now we have 12 focused sectors um, then we are telemed to bring in international events that serve those focused sectors by the government so yes uh, we are open come talk to us mm -hmm. good stuff okay andrew hi um, I think first and foremost, when it comes to travel restrictions, we are closely monitoring uh, the source markets to our international exhibitions. And one of the approach is really to, to formulate what we call a travel bubble. I mean, we have already been seeing it between Australia and New Zealand. We see another one that's forming between the Baltic states. So using ASEAN as an example, when, when the situation is a little bit more stabilized, we'd be more than happy to work with TSEP Thailand, Malaysia to form that travel bubble within the ASEAN region as a whole, that's one. Uh, number two, when it comes to important VBIPs or buyers coming to trade shows, we are working on a green lane clearance so that this buyers would be able to enter Singapore even though there might be some travel restrictions, of course, subject to certain health considerations and checks. Uh, the third part perhaps is really looking at the levers to help such events to happen. Um, we are very mindful that when it comes to trade shows uh, and, you are do and we have been doing attendance building or doing road shows at our regional markets, we might not be able to do so now because of safety distancing. So what we have launched is a new marketing partnership program. And this is a really a 20 million uh, Sing dollars program where you can actually tap on that funding for marketing costs or additional funding boosters uh, to collaborate with other tourism stakeholders and such costs can be used on hybrids or webinars or even uh, virtual platforms. And that helps you to build attendance uh, for a start before the physical event can take place in the later part of the year. And we have just opened up the scheme and it's a, fun it's a funding of as high as 70% to the my sector and the application just opened up in May. So I would encourage uh, stakeholders in Singapore to help with that. And last but not least, um, in a situation where we do have travel restrictions, when we resume business, uh, that is the part that we have to work very closely with our event organizers to come up with a virtual platforms and engagement. We are mindful in terms of the industry we work with. So for, for Gamescom, for instance, which is really about esports and video gaming, I mean, the attendee profile would be very digital savvy. It's mm. not hard to switch to a virtual platform. But for shows that's talking about heavy equipment or perhaps food, uh, they might have to form a virtual platform offline from the physical show. Uh, 
So these are the couple of discussions and engagement we have so far, and uh, we'll be more than happy to, to advise anyone if you are keen to tap on the marketing partnership program. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Uh, Stuart, what, Hong Kong obviously relies on uh, international events. What, what do you think about the idea of a travel bubble, so to speak? Yeah, look, I mean, obviously, Hong Kong, as you said, relies, it's a it's population of seven and a half million people. So, so we're a trading port, essentially. So we need people to come in and go out. Um, we're, we're lucky. We've had uh, 23 days here with no new local infection. So the magic number is 28. And when we hit that, then we're kind of technically COVID free. Um, so we'll start by looking at other markets, which are the same. Um, now, obviously, I mentioned China on the 8th of June, we, 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 we can do business with them. That's our biggest market anyway. So that's, that's the kind of the number one that we need to get open quickly. Um, and then on the 18th of June, well, at the moment, it's due, the ban is due to come off with the rest of the world. But I don't see that happening. I think we're going to have second waves. And I, I think we're going to play this global game of whack-a-mole where, a, you know, a, a new kind of area kind of has a second wave and we lock that down and then another one and et cetera. But what I do hear a lot of talk about at the moment is a kind of a, a North Asia free movement zone. So therefore, you know, if, if China and uh, Japan and Korea, um, you know, are all at the same levels that we are, then we create our own bubble and we do business. And that's, you know, that's not a bad bubble to be in. Um, and then you look, at, look to partner with other bubbles. So perhaps Australia and New Zealand they've created their own bubble. Could we kind of get together and say, okay, you know, you come to us and we'll come to you. Um, it's not fail safe and there may well be that restrictions are moved backwards and forwards, but it seems like a good way to, good direction to move in. In terms of getting people into the hall, uh, I met with somebody earlier this week um, who they're working, it's, a, it's a, uh, a local company, they're working on a blockchain solution um, whereby you have an app on your phone and it knows the people that you've come to contact with and the data should be more secure um, because, it's, because it's a blockchain solution, but it should be robust enough, not as robust as uh, um, um, a vaccine would be, but robust enough that it should give people a lot more comfort that they can enter exhibitions uh, safely. Uh, I, I, Michael made a point earlier about, you know, maybe we have to reduce the number of attendees. I mean, that kind of goes against the grain of everything that organizers try to do. You know, we, we, we promise our exhibitors we're going to get lots of buyers. For us to suddenly say, well, no, we can't have as many as normal is, that's going to be pretty difficult. But if that was the case, obviously we as organisers, we'd want to select who the buyers that we let in the hall are. If we're only allowed 5,000 people in the hall today, I want it to be the people walking around with money in their pocket rather than, <laughs> you know, the tyre kickers, right? <laughs> All right, thanks, Stuart. And since you mentioned uh, a second wave, we'll go to uh, Vijay Sharma, who's on the call. He's one of UFI's NGL grant winners, uh, and he had a question actually about a second wave. Vijay, are you there? Hello. Can you hear me? I sure can. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. My question is for Michael and for Grace. Uh, is there a plan B if a second wave kicks in? So, have you already said some indicators? which would allow you uh, to actually see this through? Can you, if, if yes, can you walk us through? Grace? Uh, if you're talking about China, um, recently there are a couple of, uh, you know, second wave, uh, if you, if you notice uh, in Jilin, for example, you know, for mm. the past uh, few days, and they have uh, double digits uh, confirmed cases. So I think um, with the severe measurements that Chinese government is taking, um, really most of the cases are imported cases. So very unfortunately, if there is a high risk of, uh, of uh, a second wave, uh, it's mostly, you know, the, the, the travel, uh, you know, the travel restrictions will be, uh, uh, will be uh, continued. Uh, so I, I don't think, um, I don't think there is a very high chance of second wave uh, in the next uh, two, three months at least, uh, because uh, China is very careful in opening up and, uh, 
as, uh, as uh, Michael also uh, mentioned, uh, every single exhibition that is uh, allowed to open has very uh, detailed uh, instructions and guidance and, uh, uh, for implementation. So um, I hope it doesn't come back uh, quickly, at least. Thanks, Grace. Yeah, I'm not sure I share your optimism on no second wave, <laughs> but uh, we'll see. Uh, Michael, uh, you want to comment on that? Yeah, sure. The simple answer is no, we don't. But then I have to feed back on you and, and asking you, what's the definition of a wave? Because if you look at the actual figures we had here in Shanghai, even all over China except Wuhan, but even then the Wuhan figures uh, be the couple of thousands uh, compared with uh, what we've seen in the rest of China, uh, I would not call this a wave. Probably if the figures are correct in the US or India, I'm not sure where, where or Russia probably, that is probably more like a wave. Even in the high peak time in February, especially here in Shanghai, in greater Shanghai area, uh, we were far from having a first wave. There were a larger number of cases, yes, but not really a wave. So even if, it, if, so if, the, if the daily infection rates, which is now single digit, if it goes to double digits, is that a wave? I don't think so. So if that would happen, which is unlikely at the moment, then we would most probably, if the figures would be like that, within a double digit, we probably would go, we still follow the same protocols as we just are starting to implement. So I'm, as with Grace, uh, I, well, I'm not a virologist, I always call these guys, but um, no ideas, special yeah. plan, no. Thanks, Michael. Okay. Uh, Next, we'll go to Enrique. She has a question for Nichapa. Yes. Here. Uh, is she there? Enrique? Here. Yes, I'm here. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, you, you want to ask um, Nichapa a question? Oh, we've muted her again. Hi, everybody. Hi. Thank you. And uh, hi, Nichapa. Yes, hi. You, Nichapa. Hi. How are you? Okay. Thank you. Uh, you told about a three year plan uh, from your government. Can you tell us something more about this uh, important initiative? Thank you. Right. Um, thank you. This three year restoration plan, of course, we see that before everything comes back to new normal or the normal, um, it would probably takes um, it would probably take a few years. So we at first we start off with the idea that what would it take or how can we support in order to stabilize and also build the foundation or even make it stronger so that once the business event comes in, they can really capitalize um, the opportunity rather than worrying what would happen from those uncontrollable. Um, so the uh, restoration plan basically would focus on key sectors and the infrastructure, basically the ecosystem of exhibition, which means that we have to work at, as one with the government, relevant government body um, in facilitating whatever um, services that would help facilitate uh, the business events. Secondly, in terms of the business sector, uh, the focus sector, the government should somehow provide subsidy and also support funds from responsible um, ministry so that we can use um, exhibition as a tool to drive and gear the development forward. Um, so in so instead of pulling such a budget from central government or from TSEP, we are now coming up with a pool of source of fund from different sources of funds so that uh, once any exhibitions com comes in, they can really enjoy not only the privilege in terms of funding, but also the facilitation from relevant party. Um, right now, it used, we used to have 12 sectors, but right now in order to move the country forward, medication, uh, medical comes first and then tourism definitely. There are biotech, um, the uh, logistics um, also uh, one of the keys and there are many others. So right now the three years plan uh, would involve sectors, financial, 
um, the collaboration between domestic and international, and also the uh, investment privileges from the Board of Investment. I have the whole stack of paper. If, if um, you like, I can share it with you. Great. Th th thanks, Nichapa. Uh, okay, next we'll go to Ian Sterling. Ian, uh, I believe you have a question, right? Uh, yes, sir. thanks, Mark. Uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, interesting session. It's largely to Grace and Michael, I suppose. Um, you know, good news regarding the Hunan Auto Show. Uh, but these events, largely, I think, for all of us are going to be uh, on a domestic level. Is there any sign of when any international events will be taking place? Yeah, I think uh, it's it's um, uh, still very difficult because uh, right now the uh, travel restriction is still in place. Um, foreign nationals uh, having visas or even for people who have uh, work permit uh, or residence permit are not allowed to go back yet. So um, with that, I, I doubt very much uh, international events, which uh, expect a lot of uh, uh, overseas visitors uh, can be successful in that way. Uh, in that sense. So until, uh, which could come very quickly. I mean, uh, we, we had uh, surprises a few times. Uh, uh, you know, on, on, on May uh, 21st, 22nd, they have these uh, two parliamentary sections. And uh, I, I just personally think that um, uh, after the, uh, these two sections, uh, things will be relaxed. And uh, in due course, uh, hopefully uh, the, um, the confirmed cases in, uh, in, in Europe and in America uh, will come down and, uh, and that will give uh, more confidence for the uh, Chinese government to open up the country again. And, and also, you know, with all the uh, flights uh, reduced, so it's, it's not just the Chinese government doesn't want, you know, to, to allow a foreign nationals to come in, but, uh, you know, just it is two way internationally flights are reduced and uh, uh, everybody is still, you know, having this uh, partial lockdown. So, uh, yeah, it, it takes time. Uh, Michael, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, certainly what, what Chinese government is always doing they are testing the waters and we have seen this, uh, I have seen this myself in a couple of decades meanwhile, uh, just to mention the introduction of the VAT system versus the business tax, which was in 2016. So we basically got a notice two weeks before the implementation of a new VAT. So having said that, the announcement last Friday of, of allowing uh, exhibitions to, to reopen again came as a surprise as well and I would not be surprised uh, if the opening of some routes, international routes, would also be announced then sooner or later overnight. And uh, talk about international events, um, uh, Ian, it's, it's like, well, especially in China, we have so many companies with international staff and headquarters, meanwhile. So even the international travelers would not come from Europe or America or wherever. Uh, just by the look of the faces of the attendees, of the, of the foreigners living and working in China uh, might already give an atmosphere, a flair of international show to that now domestic show, let's say. So definitely no international travelers could come in, but the, the mix of people, how they look like, would give you the atmosphere because probably headquarters from Europe would then ask their overseas foreign staff in China to attend such shows. But just guessing here. Thanks, Michael. Uh, okay, last chance to ask any questions. If you have one, uh, put it in the chat. Uh, Stuart, I'm gonna go back to you because uh, I, I made a note during your opening remarks. You said that um, what Hong Kong has offered so far isn't gonna be enough. So I'm just curious when you talk to the members of HASEA, what will be enough? What, what do the members really need to get through to the other side of this crisis? 
Sure. Yeah. Look, I, I mean, I, I think if you look at the panel of people that we've got here, um, we've got Need Chapa uh, and we've got Andrew, who are obviously being paid the, their salary by a government. Um, you've got Grace, who's far too nice to say anything too pointed. So I guess it, it, it's it's down to me to have a go yes, at the it government. Is. <laughs> <laughs> um, so look, I mean, as I said earlier, we, we, we're grateful for what's been put in place, um, but we, we'd like to see more. Uh, you know, in particular, the, uh, you know, the the, the money that which is being given to SMEs to join TDC shows, we think that that should be increased to every show um, because we need people that, that get out there and do business. I mean, if, if you think about it in these terms, if you are a widget manufacturer and, and, and you've got a factory um, and you're, you know, you're producing these things, what's the one thing that, you know, after a difficult period of the last four months, the one thing that you need to do is get out there, find sales leads, be, build your sales pipeline, and get business started again. What's the best way of doing that? Well, we know it's trade shows. The number one reason people join trade shows is to, to get sales leads, to meet people, to fulfill orders. Equally, you know, you've got people who are buyers, distributors. Now, some of these people might be in overseas markets, and they'd love to come to the trade show, the International Hong Kong Widget Trade Show, and buy, you know, the latest, newest, flashiest widgets, but Maybe their company's had a bad time. Maybe they've had to lay off staff. Maybe there's a, you know, travel restrictions in to, to, to save cost. Well, it would be great if our government said, OK, we are going to help uh, organisers with hosted buyer programmes bring some of these people in because we know that they are amongst those 5,000 people that we want in the hall because they've got cash in their pockets, they've a desire to buy, and we can kind of get them in there and do it. Um, other sectors that I, you know, I look, and I, I, I really do feel sorry for them um, is a lot of the smaller suppliers, um, people that build exhibitions, put AV together, all of that stuff. Um, they are often, you know, uh, got large workforces. Um, they've often got, you know, fairly low margins on what they do. Uh, and normally, you know, if the exhibition business isn't there, then they pivot to the retail trade and, and, and build pop-ups and things like that. But, but the retail has been, been completely decimated as well. So uh, I, I think another area that we, we cause we're going to need them when the industry comes back is we really need to look after our exhibition suppliers and therefore the government needs to beef up those general schemes of, you know, rent uh, and, and salary subsidies in order to help those people survive so that they're there when we need them to be when, they, when we come back. Yeah, th thanks, Stuart. And I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, you know, we don't think about the stand contractors enough because if we're trying to get not just to scan stand contractors, but uh, when we go back to uh, work back to business, if they're not there, it's going to make uh, the events a lot harder to get off the ground. Uh, I just see Michael Duck on the call there. Michael, I don't know if you want to make a comment about any sort of a, a wish list that you have of any of the uh, informal markets in Asia about what the kind of support you'd like to see. Oh wait, he's on mute. Can I unmute him? Can someone help me unmute Michael? There we go. Okay, you let me know. You can hear me? Yep, we can now. Yeah, sorry, I, I, I've been late coming into this. And, uh, quite a few things going on here at the moment. As you, as you know, there have been some changes in the China requirements and market. So uh, we're going to be putting on some shows earlier than expected in the China market. Uh, which I'm very pleased with and uh, should be a good news for the rest of the industry going forward. Uh, Michael's aware of these uh, and, and uh, certainly uh, I'm sure you may well have, uh, have uh, discussed some of this uh, already. Um, you know, uh, I, I'm sure that Stuart has, has discussed what the uh, Hong Kong government has put through. I think that, you know, it's been terrific what, they, what they've been putting forward. It's very pleasing to see them being proactive here. Um, I just want them to be able to be a little bit more uh, proactive with, from the industry as to what's needed now. I just caught the end there about Stuart talking about cash flow positions of smaller companies. It's not just smaller companies, there are bigger companies. We can see, right. unfortunately, Cathay Pacific, most of its planes are sitting on the, on the, uh, at the airport at the moment. So cash flow is as, as important to small companies and big companies alike. Um, and so the earlier that uh, governments can get cash back into the business, the better. Do not wait until the end of the trade shows uh, and, and do things beforehand. I'd say that's just in a nutshell 
uh, and at this late stage of, uh, I'm sure, what's been a very interesting uh, uh, program uh, from me. Th thanks, Michael. Appreciate that. All right, everyone, we're a little over time, so we're going to wrap up now. Uh, thanks to everyone for joining the call. I want to point out Jess just posted in the chat the link to the uh, UFI coronavirus resource page. Uh, UFI has been working nonstop for the past couple months to add to that with a lot of valuable information, uh, updates on our activities, frameworks for reopening, our efforts for advocacy to highlight what, uh, what came out in Matt's question, which is separating, uh, making sure governments understand the separation between uh, mass events and exhibitions. So I encourage you, all of you, to take a look at that page and see what's valuable for your business in there. Also want to thank all of our uh, diamond sponsors as usual, and especially Nichapa, who is on the call right now. So thanks to uh, thanks to TSEB, to Qatar, to Shenzhen World, and to Freeman. All right, everyone, that's a wrap. Thank, thanks very much for being here. And uh, the next, next UFI webinar, I think, is tomorrow, or maybe in a few hours. So uh, <laughs> keep an eye on this space. Thanks very much.